Yay, greetings. We're well into 2022, but can we take the opportunity to to wish you a happy New Year? This is the first time we'll have had the opportunity to speak to a, a lot of you in the New Year. Hope you're having a yes. great time. Michael here. And... Uh, and Rupert here, and I've just realised I need you to close the window somewhere else because I can't. No, I've just got time lag. We're open somewhere else on my computer. Uh, Go away. Right. Stop uh, it. It's that one. <laughs> yeah, it's all right. Everything's normal it, again. <laughs> yes, you're in safe hands, folks, as you know. <laughs> we were just saying before we uh, came on, on that uh, it's just so great to see many of you uh, um waiting for us ha happily there i hope uh, you enjoy what's to come we've got a fine pile of questions to uh, uh, get through tonight and uh, wonderful uh, uh, talking points um, you know that we're looking forward to having a a deep dive into so yeah, yeah. it's it's good to see you. i mean it, it it's something we love the fact that i mean you're you're just everywhere aren't you we love the fact that you're uh, uh, yeah, yeah. You're you're watching from all over the world. New Zealand, Somerset, yeah. Virginia, Maryland, <sighs> London, Netherlands, Michigan, uh, Scotland, South Yorkshire, Austria. Sibyl is in Austria, of course. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, if we mentioned you all by name, we'd never get round to answering any questions. <laughs> but just let it be known. We appreciate you uh, you being here. Of course, if you've not been with us before, uh, I, I haven't spotted any names I, I don't recognise in the timeline there. If you've not been with us before, the prehistory guys, uh, do let you um, do um, uh, let us know who you are and uh, and where you're from. Uh, it's always great to see new names uh, come up. Um, if you've not been on a prehistory guys question time before this is um, once every month on the second Thursday of the month at eight o'clock we uh, go live and attempt to answer really excellent questions that have been asked by raving fans during the last month we always put a placeholder up on the uh, community for people to uh, place their questions um, so uh, yeah and that that sort of that list closes by about today <laughs> sometime um yeah so yeah, the, pro we get the show late entries don't we <laughs> we do um show goes on for what's usually about 90 minutes or something like that so uh, settle down stick around and uh, we'll do our best to um entertain you and um well at least plumb the depths of our uh, knowledge stroke ignorance <laughs> yeah auntie win in hawaii hey Fabulous Fantastic. stuff, guys. Fabulous stuff. What's the weather like down there? Lovely. <clears throat> so before we proceed, <laughs> um, do we have uh, any news to um, relay to uh, to people about uh, what's been going on, uh, what's coming up, that kind of thing? It's been a bit uh, um, of a strange time, so we're not quite firing on all cylinders at the moment. Uh, but rest assured, um, you know, things are in the pipeline and uh, will be happening. Yes. Yes, it it was a strange end to 2021 and mm. uh, uh, and uh, a strange beginning to 2022, but yeah. uh, but we uh, yeah, we're doing our best to hit the ground running, mm, mm. Um, uh, with lots of housekeeping and stuff like that. Um, yeah, yeah, housekeeping. What fun! Have we got any new news? Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we haven't got any new news though, have we? I don't think so. Uh, no, no, not particularly, except the next interview, the next uh, interview that's coming out that will be published from us uh, is a really great one. Uh, Lee Clare, lead archaeologist mm. and one of the lead archaeologists uh, at uh, Gebekli Tepe at the moment. Uh, some fascinating facts to come from him in our hour-long interview. Um, yeah, mm. you, 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 I'm sort He's of... He's the I'm, overall project coordinator, so if he doesn't know, nobody knows. Exactly, yes. I'm thinking mm. of sort of labelling... Uh, uh, the in interview, uh, Gobekli Tepe. Uh, every no, everything you ever wanted to know about Gobekli Tepe, but were afraid to ask. How would that go down? Do you think <laughs> you could do that, could or do everything that. you wanted to know about Gobekli Tepe, but didn't know was there to be asked? Uh, correct that one as well. Because there's certainly a lot of that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Um, yeah. uh, that said, I think you know uh, that's about it for the uh, for the time being, as far as going forward is concerned. Except I have mm. to mention, and a lot of the friendly names, you know, the usual suspects that are uh, um, engaging in the chat there, we know uh, very well, and a lot of them are um, supporters of ours on uh, Patreon. Um, without whom we couldn't really uh, do this. And without no, a growing support, we can't really do this. So if you feel inclined at any point um, that uh, you think we're doing such a good job that we need all the help we can get, um, pop over to our Patreon page. I think you'll find the link uh, down below. Um, and have a look and see how you you can you can contribute to our well-being. <laughs> There are perks. <laughs> there are perks, yes. It's not all one way. In fact, you know, having mentioned the interview, I mean, one thing you do get, we always, oh, always, no, we have forgotten once or twice, to be honest, but we usually do an extended version of whatever interviews we do and uh, ask supplementary questions special for us. Our Patreon folk. There's a, um, uh, a an exclusive uh, short podcast every Monday that comes out called the Monday Moot, uh, in which we uh, Rupert and I wax lyrical about <laughs> pretty much whatever comes into our minds. Uh, it's yeah, the, anything, the regards of our troubled minds. Is well, regarding those, yeah. prehistoric ar archaeology, we do try to keep it on the uh, uh, mm. on the straight and narrow there. Um, yeah, and ad free stuff. All the stuff that gets posted on YouTube is it's, uh, over on Patreon as well, but that without the ads and general sort of behind-the-scenes stuff as well. Uh, if that sounds attractive in any way, pop over and we'd uh, love to see you. Fantastic community to be in, I have to say as well. That's the cherry. Yes. That is really the uh, 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 cherry on the cake, isn't it? What is it? The icing on the cake is the fact that... It, it's, it's, <laughs> It's a lovely uh, bunch of people. Yeah, yeah both, yeah. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Hi, tell Carvetti me. I Films. I can't help thinking oh. that I should know what your name is. Um, um, but yeah, hi. <laughs> no, I, th I think uh, Car Carvetti I Films um, kicks off is the first question answered. So that's quite a good segue okay. into it's starting segue. to answering answer, um yeah airing your questions so let's have a look yep oh, i'm not wrong carvetio films oh, <laughs> oh it's, that's <laughs> that's coming up first okay well i'm gonna have a damp squib to begin with then have you got a favorite one michael well i have and you can leap on Excellent. with this or think of something else it's um, it's not quite a lost monument, but it's sort of lost in some ways. So, Carvetti I Films, do, do either of you have a favourite lost monument, still visible via crop marks or scanning equipment? And the first thing that came to my mind is not necessarily lost, because uh, to anybody that goes there, the remains are still there, plain in the landscape. But what is lost about it is the incredible uh, post holes um, revealing one of the most significant monuments that there is in the British Isles. Uh, I'm talking, um, of, uh, uh, of course, of... Um... <laughs> oh, <God. laughs> the place with God. the post holes. Not sto stony... Durrington Walls? Uh, no, not Durrington Walls. Stony Littleton? What's no. <laughs> what? uh, in Somerset. In Somerset? Stanton Drew? Stanton Drew. I knew it would begin with st. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stanton Drew. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's a good start, isn't it? Mm. Yeah. Stony uh, uh, Stanton Drew. Um, yeah, the lost element of uh, Stanton Drew, uh, if you've seen our film, Standing with Stones. I tell you what, it's way too early in the evening to be having seen your moments, seriously. <laughs> oh, no, bring them on. Um, uh, if you've seen our film, Standing with Stones, it's one of the big inspirations, uh, you know. And um, Mike Pitts, in his book, Hengeworld, opens 
the book, the entire book, uh, with the original discoveries that were made at uh, Stanton Drew uh, about the um, radar, the ground penetrating, um, the ge uh, geophysics that was done there that revealed the concentric circles of uh, timber post holes and the fact that uh, surrounding the um, existing um, uh, standing stones that you can, the existing stone circle that you can still see in the landscape, of course, was the most enormous henge. Um, so, yeah, from the point of view of having sparked our imaginations and, and got us going on quite a long trip, actually, as far as our relationship to henges and what they were for, um, Stanton Drew has to stand really high up in, uh, in our list of favourites of of so-called lost mm. monuments. Now, Rupert, mm -hmm. the thing is, I mean, that's uh, easy for me. <laughs> as long as I can <laughs> remember <laughs> names yeah, and well things. Um, <laughs> that, that's me. Anything off the top of your head in terms of a, a lost monument. I can't say I, I, I don't have a favourite. Uh, there, there are certain things that, I mean, with any of the palisaded sites so that could be you know Durrington Walls or Stanton Drew or uh, mm. you know what I would love to know is how tall were those posts because yeah. just because they're massive uh, you know trees um, you know if it was a meter across for example there's a whole ring of them you know as we've said before when we've been talking about our theories of um, uh, of animal husbandry, that if you're dealing with a lot of cattle, say, then what you need is enough timber in the ground to actually take the impact of uh, any amount of, you know, cattle weight pushing against them. They mm. only need to be the height of any normal modern day fence. You know, you could have a timber uh, fence that was, you know, say, two metres tall, not even that, a metre and a half. Um, so long as it's deep enough into the ground, then it's going to take any amount of weight pushed against it. So mm. they might not have been tall at all. Mm. Um, mm. So I'd like to know that. Um, and the only other one that really springs to mind is in the field next to the King's Stone at the Rollwright Stones, oh. where William Stukeley uh, uh, talked about and described this... Uh, uh, ditched and banked rectangular uh, enclosure in the field adjacent and that's just ploughed flat you can still see it in crop markings but oh, i'd love to know what that was about i really wish yeah. they'd excavate yeah. that properly martin i wasn't suggesting that uh, stanton drew isn't uh, there anymore uh, it's just that the lot there is a lost element of it um that uh, is invisible unless you um yes. know you know you, you you've you've discovered that, that it's there it sort of uh, brings the sad thing about Stanton Drew is that it's a bit uninspi uninspiring on its own the, 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 the stones themselves quite large but they're kind of dull and they're so spread out across the field that it rather loses its impact when you, when you imagine these timber posts in the middle though and the, and the hinge mm. around, it uh, it kind of comes to life. The only other thing I would add in before we move on, um, thanks for the question, by the way, the only other thing I would add in there before we move on is something that we were looking at earlier, just you know, a few hours earlier when we were just nattering about stuff that's come up for us. And um, there's a, a study, uh, a paper in the Proceedings of the Prehistoric Society, which arrived for me earlier today, uh, which, is <laughs> which is all about the palisade, which is all about the palisaded enclosures of uh, the West Kennet uh, palisaded enclosures, you know, just down by the um, uh, Kennet River between, well, in sight of Silbury Hill, should we put it that way? Avebury being just over the hill and West Kennet Long Barrow up the hill, but they are lost. But what a fabulous array of enclosures, palisades. Mm. Um, uh, all sorts of fences and uh, avenues going off in all kinds of direction uh, with no indication above ground nowadays mm. uh, that what was once there. Tantalising stuff. We have our ideas. Yeah. We will 
we look forward with interest it, to. Uh, it's an interesting thing, though, isn't it? You know, when we talk about you know the concentric rings of of timber posts at Stanton yeah. Drew, and we know we know that there were a few, uh, but uh, but you know, it's most of these sites haven't been tested for it, and yeah. you know, it is just it is so likely that you know if we went and tested everywhere across the country, that we'd find that they were an awful lot more common than people think. Yeah, uh, David mm. um, is. Um, uh, quite right, David Potter. The Druids' Arms is worth a visit. <laughs> <Hello>, David. <laughs> yes. Here's a good. Here's another good thing about Stanton Drew. It's not quite on the level of Avebury for having a pub right in the middle of the stone circle, but uh, the Druids' Arms uh, in the village of Stanton Drew actually does have a couple of the outliers. Uh, has a, a cove. Uh, is it the cove? It it's does. the remains of the it, cove. A cove. The cove is. Uh, Yes, the cove is uh, in the back garden of the pub. Yeah, yeah, or one of them. The, the, I think there was a couple. There's a cove at, at least down to up to the northwest of the uh, circle as well. In the same cove field. I think so. Cove. Yeah, I interpret I them as coves. I don't know if they have been by other people. Anyway, maybe I do remember us looking at a ramshackle timber thing that had been there for I don't know not that long but was not very well looked after and it was just three sides of badly put together timber and we laughed and said it was a cove mm -hmm. don't know about <laughs> to... <laughs> apart from that I yes, don't remember it was, yeah, no, that's, well, it's absolutely right but that was what was inspiring our thoughts about coves was the fact that there was the big stone cove down in the corner of the field i think that's what went on mind you i'm talking about 15 years ago so jesus <laughs> that's true that's true kevin uh, says you know the etymology of the word drew i don't actually uh answers on a postcard well, please stanton david do you know uh, uh well uh, john john stanton answered. you would say would have to be to do with tin surely it's, it? no it's stanton. stone oh no Stanton Harcourt, the, any, oh, anything with Stanton, Stanton, Harcourt, yeah, Stanton, you can guarantee yes. that it has, or once upon a time had, a stone circle. Had so, stone Drew, so Drew, I don't know, I don't know, there you go, that's one to look up. Um, yeah, but I don't know about the Druid bit. Uh, no. Prob who, who knows? Um, could stone circles serve as bracing for interior timber fencing? Dale, I absolutely... I think in some circumstances, absolutely yes. Evidence? None. Conclusive evidence? No. Not so far. Thank you. Um, thank you for the question. Uh, that's a good uh, start. And uh, who knew we could, well, we always knew we could, we could uh, talk forever about mm. such things, don't we? Okay, Andrew, moving on. Indeed. Oh, Jimmy. Hi, Jimmy. Thanks, Kevin. Are you here? Jimmy Lawley, have you Hello, seen Jimmy. any striking similarities in design that make you think the same people may have been responsible for more than one circle or barrow? Do you think there was an artisan class who carried a design philosophy of mm -hmm. any kind? <laughs> Do you know what, Jimmy? <laughs> um, have we seen any striking similarities? No, you'd have to say no. I mean, because when you get a what some you know something that's essentially a simple structure whether that's a stone circle uh, or a mound or whatever then they're too similar to they're not complicated enough for you to look at them and say oh that must have been done by somebody who knew how you know it's, mm -hmm. um, it, it, it was obviously it, uh, it was a way of doing things having said that we have only half jokingly said a number of times and i genuinely believe this to be the case but it's a bit like uh if you've ever moved house with a piano that you know you <laughs> where try are you to going with this <laughs> <laughs> the thing is that if you try to move a piano uh sorry i i once moved a piano down two flights of stairs and into a basement with a friend of mine and it nearly killed us 
and uh, and then you get the removal men in because you're moving house and the guys who know how to do it throw the piano around like it's a box of oranges and so when you look at some of the sites with ridiculously big stones i'm quite sure that there were you know whether it's project managers yeah there's that guy up in wherever let's get him down because he'll have this sorted in no time just somebody who knows how to manage the project. So yeah, I do think that there were the engineers of the uh, the Neolithic and early Bronze Age who uh, who would travel around and offer their services. I do believe that. Mm. Cool. Uh, if that uh, K- the question. KW Green, uh, one of the guides at May's house, Kate. said, "Hello, Kate." Oh, it's Kate. Uh, one of the guides at May's house says he thinks there was a class of people who built chambered tombs and stone circles. I think that area up there from uh, Ireland uh, across to the west coast of Scotland and up to um, uh, up and around across to Orkney is a particular case in terms of communication and travel and uh, um, and and. Um, interaction uh, over distances there and i think uh, you can't uh, eliminate a lot of the design themes uh, there the other thing is of course we're talking about schematic design here to a large degree that was what was first in my mind you know is how you put stones together but of course we haven't mentioned uh, so-called art um and uh, the similarities in those terms uh, are, are quite striking, and you wonder how those were passed down, or whether there's something um, um, uh, immutable uh, about how uh, that kind of imagery occurs to us as, as human beings. Um, uh, the uh, you know the, the basic. Uh, patterns that emerge from uh, hallucinogenetic hallucinogenetic states or uh, induced trance and those kinds of of things. Maybe that could be responsible for the similarity in those kinds of respects. Um, Don't know. Um, Very hard to establish any kind of method to uh, prove or uh, extrapolate an answer to these kinds of questions. That's the problem, I think, uh, uh, Jimmy. And we just keep to have to keep throwing mud at the wall and see what sticks. Um, mm. Yeah, but it's a it's, it's a good question. Anything else we've got there? Uh, on, on that specifically, no. I, you know, it, it's that thing, isn't it? That when um, when there is an accepted. Um, a theme isn't the word I'm looking for, but you know, a fashion that um, you know, even the even the way we we take it for granted, you know, with our coffee mugs, for example, the shape of our coffee mugs. Uh, it's not that many different styles, really, you know. And would we look at those? You know, would archaeologists look at our coffee mugs in however many thousand years? you know and say that uh, that you know it was this culture um and it's you know there's a way of doing things it's like you know when you have um uh, linear bank ceramic yeah any of the uh, um, the corded ware culture for example any yeah. of those where somebody has come up with you know who was it that first designed corded ware culture and everybody went oh nice one Nice one. That's great. Let's all do that. Uh, you know, and then as a fashion, it uh, travelled quite widely. Um, it's just, it's intriguing what makes something travel the distance. You know, when you import, you know, beaker culture coming into Britain, that kind of thing. Mm-hmm. You know, why do we suddenly have that shape? And it's clearly that it's a fashion. There's nothing functionally different about that shape of beaker. Mm-hmm. Bell Beaker or, you know, whatever. It's, it yeah, is I mean, intriguing. It is a thing about human beings. We, we get entrenched in our ways of doing things. You, once you do it a certain way, you always yeah. tend to do it a, a certain way until mm. you if go, it ain't broke, oh, don't shiny, shiny. It. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> I yeah, like absolutely. that. <laughs> it's true. 
Um, it's true. So, uh, yeah, and also you've got to think in terms of time scales as well. Sometimes things that appear to uh, be related cannot be mm. by sheer dint of the dating. Mm. Got to be careful. Um, yeah, you and, have. Uh, you have. yeah, yeah, yeah. I want to digress a second because I, I, oh. I would love to reply to, or we would love to reply to all the comments. That yes, come up. we Obviously would. Can't because we'd be here all night. But I just, just one I want to pick up on from yeah, Kate, yeah, yeah. Um, because um, uh, Patrick has just made a, 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 a whimsical comment, really. But you know that guy in charge who directs all the moving of stones, and Kate said, "Or oh, that gal in charge," and uh, and the reason <laughs> sure. I want to pick up on that, Kate, is because. There was an interesting uh, paper has only just come out, uh, which is uh, they've actually had a look at some burials that they were always presumed to be men because they were warriors and, you know, whether it was heads staved in and they were buried with weapons or what have you. It's just always been presumed that they were men and they have uh, actually shown that uh, there's a good chunk of these that are women. Women warriors. Now, you know, we've known about um, the Scythians, uh, for example, in uh, oh, Eastern Scythians. Europe and going over towards Russia, or Scythians, Scythians, whatever you like. Let's not do the tomato, tomato thing this evening. Oh, and, um, <laughs> um, but, uh, but there was a, another one. Let's talk the whole uh, thing out. <laughs> comparatively recent that they've, uh, they've shown that there's a Viking burial. That again was uh, was thought to be uh, male originally, but they've uh, uh, they've shown that uh, yeah. it was a woman, and it's it's just uh, it's so manifest, really, just how much uh, women have been erased from history just because of the presumptions of early antiquarians. You know, these guys 200 years ago, 150 years ago, who would never yeah. imagine, you know, because, uh, you know, little woman's got to stay at home, um, you know, and that kind of thing. <laughs> and it's lovely that that's just being completely overturned. Uh, it's quite exciting, really. It remains to be seen quite how far that will go. Um, well, let us uh, have another question. Um, where am I? Oh, bit long question, Matt. <laughs> it's Hello, covering Matt. up half the screen. Nevertheless, <laughs> I thought, uh, yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's got some meat to it, this. Thornborough is laid out in the same form as the belt of Orion. Uh, Thornborough, we're, we're talking about Thornborough henges there. That's mm. the three enormous henges uh, up in Yorkshire. And as Matt says... Uh, they're laid out in the same form as the belt of Orion, as we know. The nativity of all things has put this on me. I've been thinking of Christmas. The three kings, belt of Orion, point to the bright star in the east. Sirius in the early evening. This shows, rises, where the sun will be on the winter solstice the following morning. Uh, and there's something just I can't read. Uh, where it will be reborn after three days of standstill, death. The whole mm. thing is an allegory for solstice. Do you have any images or ideas on alignment with something on the horizon or from the henges themselves that align with the winter solstice? Um, I'm just going to go to a different screen because so you can see us nicely. Um, do you get the gist of that uh, question then, Rupert? And do you have any wise words where do you start? Um, well, the, pl the where you start, you've asked the question. Nice picture of Stonehenge. Well, I have Thornborough. Well done with Stonehenge. Stonehenge. <laughs> Good grief! Another senior moment. Uh, uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, if anybody didn't know what, uh, you know, I'm sure you all do. My goodness, Thornborough henges looks like you know, and the you know they're big henges. They are big henges. Uh, laid out like that. But carry on talking for a moment because I can only recommend looking in this uh, book by uh, Jan Harding because uh, it's got all sorts of um, uh, simulations of uh, yeah. astronomical alignments and, uh, uh, and stuff. Now, I haven't had time 
to do a study of this, so I can't really answer your uh, question about whether this book would actually answer your uh, specific question. Um, but I can tell you that serious, I'm looking at this now, serious uh, figures um, very strongly um, is including views from the curses as, as well uh, in that, but mostly um, through, oh, here we go. Uh, there's got a view from the central henge of the midwinter solstice, solstice sunrise at 3000 BC and 2000 BC. So there we go. I mean, these are simulated, obviously, using um, astronomical um, software uh, and the like. But mm. we're talking about midwinter, what, oops, sorry, uh, solstice sunrise. Does that go anywhere near to giving you a answering the question or, or, or giving a direction? Uh, yeah, to, I, I, to look I think that's answer. a good example. I mean, it's yeah. it, it is it's interesting how many cultures around the world have have very similar um, mythology, if you like, to the Christian mythology. You know, that uh, the three wise men and all that. You know, it's um, uh, it, it, there. Are, there are so many. Uh, correlations uh, across culturally, um, mm -hmm. but there's also there's a fascinating book called Before the Pyramids by Alan Butler and Christopher Knight, <clears throat> where uh, they actually uh, put forward the theory that Thornborough henges predate uh, the Giza Plateau, and uh, and they. They think that the Giza Plateau, well, put it the other way, they think that Thornborough was actually the uh, the design work that uh, that ultimately moved to uh, to Giza. It's a very compelling book. Um, I'd, I'd recommend anybody to read it, whether you end up uh, agreeing with them or not. The rationale is quite fascinating. Uh, so yeah, before the pyramids, that's called. Um, okay, but. Um, but the so, Lassie, thing... so uh, Matt, um, I mean, I know you're absolutely fascinated because you often ask us questions about uh, Thornborough, or am I mistaken mm. that? I don't know. Um, but if you haven't got that book, get your hands on it. Mm. Uh, the other thing I would uh, point you towards, um, the other thing, uh, <laughs> Gail Higginbottom, uh, 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 she does fascinating work actually with astronomical oh, yeah, uh, yeah. lineups uh, with uh, with objects in the landscape uh, not necessarily man-made structures but uh, but where uh, say a an alignment points towards uh, a valley and that valley actually has a you know maybe a correlation with some astronomical movements um I, I would certainly look her up uh, it's gail higginbottom she uh she did a talk actually on megalithomania uh, uh the same one that we were on last year and that you can see on youtube if you if you go onto youtube and look for gail higginbottom megalithomania then that's an interesting talk as well mm. 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 Uh, okay, I'll go back to that, and um, yeah, thank you, uh, thank you, Matt. I hope there was a little bit of stimulus in there um, for you. Shall, shall we move on? Um, mm. Yeah, I, uh, I don't have anything intelligent to add to that. <laughs> uh, Jeff, how are you? Jeff, um, um, thanks for Hello, your question. Um, has any... Bronze Age cuneiform seal stones or such imprinting device been found in the British Isles. The carved stone balls that have been found seem unlikely to have had such a purpose. <laughs> uh, there's a short answer yeah. to that, and, and there's a long one, isn't there? <laughs> yeah, there's a short. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I, I wish Jeff that um, Hello, uh, Jeff. that we could give you a, a, a much meatier um, answer to this, but. As far as certainly, as far as I'm aware, I don't think you're aware of anything. Are you, Mike? Uh, that no. Um, there's a lot of uh, seal stones that you can find in. Uh, they're predominantly in the Aegean, 
and uh, Greece and even some uh, in the Middle East. Mm. But but Britain, no. Um, now I'm really intrigued actually that you you said here because it didn't it had never even grazed my consciousness before. Or you say the carved stone balls that have been found seem unlikely to have had such a purpose. I'd never actually presumed or, or even thought that they might be. But now that you've said it, I'm thinking it's not such a silly idea, really. Um, uh, and it's not that I think that they were. It's just I'd never even considered it. So thanks. <laughs> no, <laughs> thanks yeah, for uh, sowing you, that seed. It's an interesting ha- idea. Hats off to you for having such a broad. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, it's interesting. Um, the The only thing that I can kind of say maybe. Um, I don't know if any of you folks remember, we talked a while ago now, we talked about the Fulton drums. Uh, Mm -hmm. They're these um, chalk um, (sighs) drums. I mean, they're they're just, they're drum shaped lumps of chalk uh, in different sizes. And they have engraved patterns around the outside. And um, they have, been said to be measuring devices of different sorts. The current thinking, which Mike and I both think is silly, is that they're for measuring length. If you wind cord around them, they will give you a specific measure. Um, The thing is that they're not vertical sided. They're kind of uh, they're yeah, like a pork pie, the you know, they're, they're kind of curvy, rounded, which means that the diameter at the top is not going to be the same as the diameter at the bottom. Uh, and you're so not going to get sense. very many wines before you start doubling up. And no, it's rubbish. Exactly that. Um, that. Now we what were we thinking? do think <laughs> we do think that they could be weights. Yeah, well, nobody's measured one, the weight of them. I don't I haven't seen a weight. Uh, no, I've, I haven't seen that not? reported or in any paper, so I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, it, it's kind of strange, really. But mm-hmm. uh, the reason I'm mentioning them is that they have um, uh, this kind of zigzag pattern around the outside. And it was just an idea that we came up with, I mean, fairly whimsically, but it's possible that if, if you were making a wattle and daub house, say, um, you know, or you've uh, you've put a house together of whatever sort, and you've uh, you've lined the walls with with mud or plaster of some sort. Well, you know, you could take one of those discs and just roll it along the wall, and and you've got a nice uh, you know zigzag pattern for your skirting board. How many? You, you um, think I should, we should we should do that, at Jasmine Cottage, Rupert? <laughs> Yeah, you should do Mike's move. Well, I'm, I, uh, uh, yeah, in a few months' time, I'm going to be uh, myself and Sharon, my wife, are uh, moving in, and the dog, are moving uh, into uh, a house, uh, a cottage that was built in 1504. Uh, it has wattle and daub walls. Do you know what? I, I think we'll probably need planning permission to run a. Falcon drum around the, around the interior, as far as decoration is concerned. Anyway, yeah, I just thought I'd uh, mention that. Isn't that um, we're getting a bit off topic here? But isn't there? It's not one of the Falcon drums, but there's a another similar chalk thing which which marries with them, but was found somewhere else, but hasn't got any decoration on it at all. I don't yes, know. Are, that yes, sprung to my they're... mind. Yeah, they're called Falkton drums because the first ones were found in Falkton. Yeah. Um, but the other examples are not decorated. Um, and yeah, so that blows that this out. Is where I, I, I don't want to, I, I, do you know what? I, it's another one of those situations where I don't want to be rude about archaeologists, but I'm going to be. Um, I think because... we, it's an inevitability. We're going. We're going to get bolder with this in time. Well, There's so much. It, yeah. It's true. It's true. But it, it's um, one theory that's been put forward about these drums is that they are related to child burials. That there's something to do with children. Mm. And the thing is that one example, just one, has been found in a child's burial. And it was Mike Parker Pearson who said that he thinks it's to do with children. And it's just, you know, you, you've got uh, three examples found in one place, one example found in another that was in a child's burial. 
it's far more likely that, you know, if they were, I mean, just whatever they were, let, let's for the sake of argument say that, um, that they were doorstops, um, that, you know, that this little kid played with their grandmother's doorstop all the time and, uh, and they put it in the burial, you know, to say that um, mm. on the basis of not even 50% of the, uh, the examples that have been found, just one was in the child's burial. To say that, that, that it would have anything to do with children, I think is really going off on one, personally. Right. Size of drums, John asks. Um, they are. Oh, they're small. They're, 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 they're not that big. They're are kind they? of. Uh, that oh, I think size smaller is the than that. Biggest, I think. Is it the biggest one? You might be right. That's certainly no yeah. bigger than that. Although it's it's an optical illusion, though. On. Uh, Isn't it uh, funny? I've never seen a photograph that has given given anything uh, else in the picture for context for no interest. The smallest one. The smallest one is kind of the size of a pork pie. Um, yeah. Uh, <laughs> can can I look that up quickly? <laughs> uh, okay. Um, uh, where is we? Okay, that's the wrong one. I'm just trying to fill in the gap here. <laughs> so, so, oh, that's the wrong. The smallest one is uh, is four inches, just over four inches in diameter. Yeah. Okay. The the largest oh. is uh, is about six inches in diameter. Uh, so they're small. They are small. Six inches? Yeah. It's a, yeah, it's such a, a, an illusion in the photographs, isn't it? Mm. See? That that speaks to me of weights and measures. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, so thank you, Jeff. I mean, we didn't really answer your question, but we went off on one about the Falkton drums. So, <coughs> yes, um, I tried yeah. to answer your question. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> Um, it's it, you know what it's actually though just to uh, to wind up on this uh, Jeff that uh, you know you asked specifically Bronze Age and the honest truth is that I I can't think of any consistent use of uh, of seal stones or certainly seals really before the Romans. Um, mm -hmm. Now, yeah, I mean, I, I think what I'm trying, ignorance, but, uh, and that was lead, of course, not all clay. Yeah, clear. but I, I'm thinking we probably haven't answered the essence of Jeff's question, which is mm, much more about connections between East and and West. Um, mm -hmm. You know, the the possibility of a cuneiform uh, in the north of Europe, uh, northeast of Europe, well, uh, northwest of Europe. Um, you know, would throw up so many curious possibilities but in my mind if the cuneiform did persist or had existed as a was extant in uh, uh, bronze age at least britain you'd expect with reason that um uh, the um that alphabets or languages dis after that would bear some kind of relationship. Now, I don't know the Ogham or you know, all the, the symbolic um, alphabet stuff that we've got is more related to the Nordic ways of doing things than anything else. And now I'm completely at sea. What I'm trying to say is that... <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I mean. Yeah. You'd expect I some know what kind you of um, um, evolvement from that rather than from uh, something else or the fact that... Yes. Uh, Interesting. Suze uh, said, uh, yes, they could emboss pottery. Obviously, we're still talking about the Falkton drums now. Could emboss mm. pottery. That's absolutely true. The only thing is that nobody has ever found any pottery that has mm. yeah. been embossed with the pattern. Um, but it, yeah. would, you know, it doesn't mean it didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting thought. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Jeff. Um, Kate. Um, ah, Alison Wiley. Mm -hmm. We could take up the rest of the program with this, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. uh, Alison Wiley um, is a, a philosopher, a philosopher of archaeology. Uh, basically, she's uh, mm. an American philosopher, and uh, Kate says uh, that in her book, uh, Thinking From Things, that what Kate took away from it all was that 
we need to stop saying we will never know why prehistoric people did what they did or what they thought. Uh, and really interesting philosophical question. Seriously, if that is the case, why are we even bothering with archaeology? Your thoughts. That's, uh, mm -hmm. that's, a, that's, a, that's a good one. Yeah, it is a good one, but <clears throat> um, but also it doesn't matter which way you philosophize it. I don't think that you, I don't think you can know what they thought. We know what they did. Um, well, as ever and, with these things, they're going to be nuanced and uh, truly, I think we need to have read Alison Wiley's book to get the real um, take on that. But my instinct was uh, to agree with Rupert there. Uh, and uh, I think uh, prehistoric archaeology, that is, uh, and uh, I think to a large degree, I don't know, she may be talking about more about uh, American archaeology. And if she's talking about archaeology in general, so much, a lot of archaeology is done in the context of people who were writing at the same time. <laughs> that's what you're digging down to. When it comes to prehistoric archaeology, it's a different matter altogether, because we're never mm. going to find anything, you know, dig up anything, you know, that reports of what was actually going on at the time, uh, that will prove one way or another that our thoughts, our uh, mm. imaginations, are, are hitting the mark with what was going on from the evidence that we've uh, mm. we've dug up. Um, it is true to say, though, I, I, you have to separate out the what they did and what they thought, because, uh, oh, yeah. you know, you, you know, you, you, it, it's fair to say that that nobody ever knows what anybody else thinks unless they happen to externalize those thoughts um, in terms of what they did. Uh, you know, th th there's all sorts of ways that you can uh, through archaeology, you can show what people might have done in a uh, you know in these situations i mean take a burial for example you know we know that they did you know whether it was excarnation or you know various things that they did how they related to that what they thought about that and their reasons for doing this aspect of it or that aspect of it we'll never know why well we might but we probably won't know why but what we do know is that they did it and i think one of the most important um, aspects of, of this kind of separation is it, you look at the archaeology that's been done in the last 150 years, say, um, and, uh, and take, for example, uh, yeah, our, our particular soapbox, if you like, that, you know, you have the sacred landscape. You know, you look, you look across Wiltshire and you've got the sacred landscape. That everything was ritual, this and ceremonial, that. And we're saying, nah, it's a farm. Um, or something similar, you know. Now, the the thing is that what the archaeology has done has revealed uh, what people built, or or where people were living and where people were doing certain things. What does change over time is our ability to interpret it. So the value of archaeology uh, moving forwards is it's that's a that's a movable feast you know our, our ability to interpret grows all the time um so you know I, I think that's an important thing to cling on to really the thing is about um archaeology it it is a bit inward looking if you, forgive me I, I get this impression and it uh becomes a bit of a, a lore unto itself and archaeologists get fascinated about what other archaeologists and they themselves uh, think and get wrapped up in uh, interpretation and forget what they're actually doing the interpretation for. So there's a, there's a divide between you know what the um, uh, perception of the purpose of archaeology is inside archaeology and a perception of what archaeology is about outside of archaeology. What is the public purpose of archaeology? And the, from my point of view, the public purpose of archaeology is pure and simply to give stories whether they're based in data facts or what what have you it's people have different ideas of, of the kind of story that excite them for some people it's pure fiction for others they like a bit of detective work they like 
actual facts on, upon which they can create their own ideas, much as many of us, we do, Rupert and I do it as well, but it's a satisfaction uh, of creating a, a self-consistent story about the, the, the knowledge that you do have and can glean. So at the end of the day, it is for the public, because they pay the bills, <laughs> and got to take into account, you know, what what is it for? It's satisfying that need for story, uh, whether it be, you know, uh, at whatever end of the spectrum of <laughs> storytelling you like to place it. Mm. And that, that is the value. And why, that is why archaeology is done in the end. Uh, and archaeologists may have a different uh, thing going on for them. It may, you know... I would have loved to have been an archaeologist for the, just for that end of, of discovering, of discovering, of discovering. Of, yeah, um, I can just uh, yeah. see you with a flint, flint assemblage. Let <laughs> 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 me think that through. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, it's funny, Sue, Sue has just uh, commented, and it is it's the perfect example, the crown that was a bucket. Yeah, and that is that uh, you know that says it all, doesn't it? You know that. Yeah. Uh, so the the value of of archaeology, you know, right there is the fact that that artifact was dug up. The fact that they wrongly interpreted it for a hundred years is is almost academic. The point is that they figured it out in the end. Mm. Um, and I think. As part of Kate's question, I just went back to it to, to, to clarify, is that you know, we're talking about, uh, I, I didn't, I, I apologise, Kate, because I, I didn't read the entirety of your question uh, for brevity's sake. And I think you also mentioned uh, archaeology as a science. I think that's what uh, kind of piqued my uh, imagination um, my, my interest when we were looking. Let me see if I can find the original, um, your original question, um, Kate. Hold on a second. Bear, <laughs> bear with me. Bear with me because it's you know it's a, it's a it's an interesting one, um, uh, and and also something that uh, that you have to say. You know, even if you're looking at just say the last fifty years. That, uh, that whilst many academics would, uh, many academics, many archaeologists would agree that until comparatively recently, while archaeology uh, was kind of on the science side of, uh, of learning, so, that it, it was an art, uh, that, you know, that much of it wasn't measurable and it was down to the best interpretations and what's changed in the last 50 years is our ability to measure mm. and calculate and mm. analyze uh, you know so you know I, I think it's quite right to say that now it is absolutely a science Mm. But uh, but you know you go back a uh, hundred years and that's uh, that's well you see me. that's where I beg to differ. Ooh. Well y yes, um, and I think this is where I would come adrift with um, what uh, whatever uh, Alison Wiley is saying uh, because you mentioned Kate. This is why I come back to the question. It, you say she is trying to make the case for archaeology as a valid science. And what I took away from it all was that we need to stop saying, as you say, it, 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 we'll never know what, why prehistoric did, people did what they did or what they thought. Now, the thing about science is that you've got to have a mechanism by which you can, um, by which you can falsify your theories. Which is okay when you've you, you're, you're, when you've got all the data in, in front of you. You can devise experiments to disprove your thought, your theory, your hypothesis. That's the trouble with you know. There's an element in archaeology where 
you get a little bit of data because that's all you can have. And then suddenly it's the Wild West with people piling in with what they think is their interpretation of that. Nobody goes to, the, well, that's probably unfair, but what needs to be done for it to be science is people need to be honest about I made this up and it's it's possible. Um, r r uh, and instead of, uh, they need to be honest and think about ways they can possibly disprove what they're saying. They have to look at what can I find? You know, what, what would it look like if I could find something that proves or disproves this before they open their mouths, before they um, put pen to paper? Mm. Um, uh, and it's, it's a sort of critical way of, a critical thought that, you know, I'd like to throw out there for, for everybody. Everybody has ideas, but at the same time, you've got to look at it from the other side. You've got to say, well, you know, great idea, but what could it be that disproves that? And how would I how would I devise a way of finding out what that is? For and it to be science. To find a way to find evidence for that idea. Yeah. You, know, you need to find supporting yeah. evidence to show the idea is valid. Yeah. There's some interesting Otherwise, comments here. I'm just uh, I, I want to skim through some of these quite quickly. Um uh Kath uh says I think it needs to be both. You have to have an imagination to see something other than a piece of rusty metal or, or rotten wood. Quite yes, so. Yes, you do. Um, and, uh, and then Kate uh, talking about um, uh, the Alison's book says uh, she addresses how we decide what is the best interpretation. That's her deeper concern, which does uh, make yeah. sense. Um yeah, and then uh, Sibylla mm -hmm. says, uh, don't forget that the division between arts and sciences is less than 200 years old. That is a very important point. Um, mm. uh, you, you know, uh, and in fact, depending on where you want to uh, uh, draw your line in the sand in, in history, as it were, you know, I mean, it's, it's the Greeks' fault, really, that we started separating everything up into different subjects in the first place. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, as and no, it is it's a fascinating topic. Uh, you know, we could talk about it for hours. But, um. Oh, we could. It'd be mm. wonderful to have an open house on it. We'd uh, love to bring a lot of people together. You know, from all strata of uh, uh, of the discipline and and uh, bring them together, see what they uh, think. Um, Carvetti, I, I uh, do you know what? We've got to find out your name. Um, it uh, says. Archaeology is deeply insecure about its scientific roots. I'm an archaeologist who would laugh at being called a scientist. I'm an artist interested in the past. Thank you very much. <laughs> Excellent. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, I, without really getting into very deep weeds indeed, I, I think uh, it's possibly time to move along. Uh, mm -hmm. you, uh, do you concur, Mr. Soskin? I do, I do. Uh, now, Kate. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, well, you, you, you guess who's the next question? Who's the who's got the next question? <laughs> it's Kate. Yeah, Kate. You snuck another uh, one in. Oh, sorry. I've, uh, there we go. Um, so we're talking about uh, other books. Gosh, you've been reading a lot, Kate. Huh? In Cummings and Richard's new book on dolmens, they come up with a theory of wonderment based on the idea, there it is, that what we experience when we see these amazing structures is wonder, and perhaps that was the intent of the people who built them. Any thoughts on <laughs> that? Well, coming on from the last question, you see the problem. <laughs> Indeed. Uh, yeah. Um <laughs> okay. Who's How would you first? devise a way of falsifying that theory? Um, see, it's not I, science. No, it isn't science in any way, shape, or form. I, hmm. um, I have a huge amount of respect for Colin Richards um, and Vicky. I don't know a huge amount about um, Vicky's work, other than we met her at a conference a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, it was largely about the uh, the work going into this book. 
And whilst <laughs> we have a lot of respect for them as I just saw what Kate said. She says she's a political scientist who laughs at being called a scientist. Yeah. <laughs> There's so much cloud and fog no, around this it, word it, science in people's yes. minds. Yeah. Yes. Um, but, uh, but the thing is that when you start having... Um, I was going to say fanciful, and I don't know if that's disrespectful. When you start having completely unquantifiable ideas, you know, maybe this and maybe that, well, yeah, but if, it, if it's completely unprovable, uh, if it's just an idea, that's not to say that you shouldn't be putting forward the ideas, but I question the... Uh, I question the sense in writing them in a book that's giving the impression that it's kind of telling you about stuff going on in prehistory. I mean, one of the things that mm, Colin mm. Richards uh, believes, for example, I say he believes it. Is that unfair of me as well? He puts it forward as a theory, so I presume mm, he believes mm. it, um, that he thinks that there was this uh, cultural or spiritual uh, belief that the rotting of the corpse, that the the oozing of bodily fluids and all the rest of it seeping into the earth and the stones, that your that the ancestors became a part of the tomb itself, and <laughs> maybe, but but the thing is. You know that it's totally made up. You know, maybe. Yeah. But, Where does it get us? Nothing. Where does it get us? Apart from understanding a bit better about the way your brain works. Yeah. In a nutshell. Mm. Uh, you know, because you know you're left. And you could point and, that and at us, because you'll hear us spout a lot of stuff, and it's a fair cop to be able to say, "Well, yeah, I hear you, but." That tells me more about the way your brain works than it does about what people were actually doing. I can buy into it. I can, you know, uh, I, I can see it as being more likely to than what other people say. But it still yeah. tells me more about the way your brain works than <laughs> it does about actual life. <laughs> yeah, it's true. See, so when you say, um, uh, or where Cummings and Richards talk about these things being constructed for their awe inspiring, uh, you know, maybe. Um, it seems unlikely to me, um, but then that's just because I think that the, the awe and wonder is, um, is maybe a byproduct. It's not, for example, uh, he said, wondering if he's just about to talk total nonsense. I, <laughs> for me, it's not the same as as say Chartres Cathedral, uh, or or take any number of Winchester Cathedral, it doesn't matter where, uh, you know, where you know that when you walk into those stunning uh, buildings, you know that, well, yeah, they were built for that wonderment and the glory of God and blah. Um, uh, now, whether a dolman uh, you know, a few stones piled on top of each other, maybe. Um, You've got to remember that they didn't I, look know, anything like what we see, like the way we see them. No, well, you know, if if you take that, a good amount of them were covered in soil. Mm. Um, so, uh, okay, not all of them by any means, but sure. uh, maybe, okay, maybe. But then, mm. and, but do you not think then, you know, if you're going to start to say that. Um, that they were constructed for that wonderment, then you can see that being a possibility for somewhere like Pentrifan or Lanyon Quoit or you know any of these ones with these enormous, beautifully laid capstones. Uh, but then, what about places like uh, Lecky Triffith in uh, in <laughs> Wales, where you get this weeny little? Dolman, waist high, that, yeah. you know, that's just, that's all, you know, that I, I think if you were looking at everybody else's dolmens and going, wow, that, you know, for you to then go and put one together, um, you know, uh, in your own village that is, 
that is frankly pathetic by comparison, then I, mm. I don't think you'd be putting it up and presuming wonderment. But then yeah. that says more about me, possibly. You know, maybe, it, 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 <laughs> it speaks know. to the fact that there are so many varieties and some are more wonderful than others. It speaks to the idea that the creation of the dolmen was the important thing and the function that it performed was the important thing. If you could build a big one and you had enough people and resources and the big enough stones to make it, then, you know, of course, people knock themselves out. Um, but there's a, again, we were talking earlier about um, design and uh, how things uh, relate to each other, and could uh, the, the same artisans uh, making things. We're talking about here, you know, a long, long heritage of the building of of, uh, of Dolmen. Sorry, that noise is my dog. Um, I will. <laughs> Oh, he's, I'm going to scratch now. It's okay. Um, <laughs> that, um, uh, yeah, the, I mean, the, the idea of dolmen building, uh, megalith building, you know, had a long, long heritage from uh, the Atlantic seaboard and into Brittany and around. And, and if you think thinking about big things, that's where it all kicked off in Brittany and Morbihan. And, you know, the there was a, a big... Uh, growth, such a big growth in impressive megalithic building from which everything else seems to descend. And it's the people that came over the, from Brittany that brought that cultural idea, who may not be still building with the same idea of making a mark on the landscape, but, but, but by the time they get here, that cultural imprint is already there. So they're building uh, for uh, to fulfil an ongoing... Um, uh, cultural, it seems, obligation in terms of their ancestors and etc. The better they can build, the bigger they can build. Sure, the better, um, but not necessarily with the same need to impress. I would have thought, and I'm that's mm. me wittering off the top of my head. Carry on, and I'm just going uh, <laughs> to say hello to the dog. Pick up, uh, I just want to pick up on a comment from Lynn um, uh, earlier on. She said. Mm -hmm. I thought dolmens were often buried to start with hard to, um, hard to me, an object. Hard, I think you, did you mean hard to be an object of wonder if no one can see it underground? Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, yeah, I mean we we kind of touched on that. Uh, it's but and the reason I'm picking up on it is because it's an interesting thing that um, that the thoughts have been changing. Uh, comparatively recently, but probably over the last I don't know twenty thirty years, uh, that. Some uh, some dolmens are known not to have been covered. Uh, some of them had earth banks going up, um, you know, even say a metre, four feet uh, up the sides, um, a, a kind of bank. Uh, the the later thinking, that your dog honestly needs. needs do you know discipline. what? Do you know what? He, he, he's his complaint. <laughs> Is it could be either that he wants to get on my lap and he doesn't because I'm you know he's just standing there uh, whimpering at me. The only other reason he, he thinks I should be on the sofa watching the television, right? Because I'm he's, he's moaning at me because I'm in the wrong place at the wrong time. The only oh, way I'm going to satisfy that is going to watch the te going and sitting on the sofa with Sharon and watching the television. So. <laughs> Uh, but uh, no, the the more recent this creature thing of with a lot of it is that um, <laughs> is that if you've gone to the trouble of uh, of finding a capstone or working a capstone that might have weighed thirty tons or twenty tons or uh, you know or even more in some cases, and you've carried it by whatever means you know whatever distance you know miles in some cases uh, that if you've gone to all that trouble to show how utterly brilliant you are at putting up this staggeringly huge capstone why would you then cover it um, and there is some truth in that uh, although you could argue that the reason that you wanted a big capstone in the first place was because it's a darn sight easier to put one stone on top if you can do it rather than corbel it and hope that it doesn't collapse uh, in the working process, you know, if you can do it with one stone and then cover it up, then you fine. You know, it's not going to collapse. It could have been as simple as that. But <laughs> but more recent thinking is is exactly that though. Is that if you've 
actually gone to that trouble to do something so utterly preposterously brilliant why would you cover it and i have some sympathy with that uh, yeah you might need a ramp there's, there's so <laughs> yeah. many different ways that that could have happened you know one of the points that we've made uh, uh, more than once um and it's something that i i will say repeatedly is that if the first antiquarians hadn't been priests or landed gentry uh, if they had been engineers, then there would be none of this mystery about how big stones were moved at all. If they'd been engineers in the first place, then it would all just be a matter of, you, know, you just do it like this. Um, yeah. So, yeah, uh, so we're, what are we? We're kind of yeah, well past the hour of um, are we what should we call on, the programme now? The internal workings of the minds of Michael Bott and Rupert Soskin, uh, uh, as displayed through the gift of prehistoric archaeology. <laughs> yeah, dear. Yes. Yes, we drag each other into our personal hells. That's what we do. Yeah. Um, so, uh, as I thought... <laughs> Stig of the Dump. Do you know what? I read that when I was a kid. Don't remember it at all. Oh, yeah. Stig of the Dump. They made a sort of a, a kid's series about that, didn't they? On TV. Yeah, they did. I yes, never watched was. that either. Okay. Look, moving along. Uh, thank yeah. you, uh, Kate. And uh, yeah, you, you got two questions in there. Well done. Yeah. Um, oh, it's Matt again. You got two questions in. Oh, Matt. Yeah. 8,000-year-old oh, wheat samples discovered yeah. 11 metres under the Solent. Do we have to rethink the map and or spread of farmers farming stroke farmers farming stroke farmers now, or is it likely that it occurred naturally in the area and was simply gathered? Mm. Gathered. Well, no, it didn't gatherer start gatherer naturally in the area. Before we, we launch off in that, I yes. know, I think I know why uh, Matt's mentioning this now is because the Blooming Daily Express have this kind of uh, ongoing rotor of old news. Well, and actually, anyway, no, in it, fairness, uh, it, I was quite, um, uh, whilst I utterly love Alice Roberts, I was a little bit, it's not her fault, it's the producers. Um, it was actually in Digging for Britain, uh, uh, last week oh fair enough uh, but that, that doesn't mean, they, mean it isn't it's still years old this it is the old discovery years, of the that's, that's samples, what i yeah. mean that yeah yeah if, if matt's saying this because he saw digging for britain last week fair enough fair enough because yeah. one of the things <clears> they did on the program was yeah, Sue says, yeah. Uh, that they did a, a a sample from the seabed in the solent and then said that they'd found the, the wheat DNA and what have you. They gave you the impression that they had done that just recently in the dig. Yeah. The, this is no. years old. Uh, and in fact, we did a, uh, I can't remember if we did a news flash on it or if it was in one of the prehistory shows or something like no, that. No, well, it was because uh, um, uh, Vince Gaffney mentioned it in passing when he was talking about uh, the work on Doggerland. Uh, he did, but we'd done a show about it before that. I think you're right. We had, yeah. Because if you remember, the reason that uh, that uh, there was an awful lot of stuff found, it was off Boldner. Is it Boldner Rocks or Boldner Cliff? Cliff. I can't anyway, Boldner, Boldner Cliff. Um, off uh, the north coast of the Isle of Wight, and uh, they found a Mesolithic boat building uh, structure. Uh, mm. Mesolithic, and uh, and they found the uh, the wheat uh, was taken up in the in the samples. There, they found it because a diver saw a lobster clearing out its uh, burrow, well, uh, well, and when uh, he went to have a closer look, found some worked flints. Oh, that's it. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, no, I was just going to uh, backtrack. It wasn't lobster that found the wheat. And I was also no, no, no. It was lobster that found exactly. the worked flints, which is what uh, actually led them to finding the site. I've the got place. this image of the lobster going, <laughs> me. <laughs> this is a, it's a flint assemblage. Oi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Never mind the pots, uh, mate. Look at this. But no, um, seriously, but, what I was going to ask was. It, it was it actual wheat that was found, or the DNA that was found? In was it sedimentary DNA. DNA? Yes. 
Cool. Yeah. Um, Clear on that. Uh, yes. Uh, it, so they, they know that wheat was there, but, um, but the thing is, uh, do we have to change our views on farming uh, in prehistory? Well, they're changing all the time anyway, mm -hmm. but that it, the thing is it doesn't mean that wheat was, uh, was in Britain. If wheat was in Britain, then it would have cropped up in the archaeological record uh, before now, before this sample in uh, uh, in the Solent. There are all sorts of possible reasons for it being there. Um, you know, even in the Mesolithic, there was an awful lot of travelling uh, across uh, the continent, you know, across continental Europe and on. Uh, you've got to remember as well that in the Mesolithic that uh, you're basically talking about a river delta down there. It wasn't uh, coastal in the same way. Um, and so it could have been dropped by somebody coming across uh, Europe. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons yeah. that it, it I, might I, I think be there. That That is the underestimation of how much trade and uh, going uh, coming and going there was in the Mesolithic. Um, yeah. I mean, if we're talking 8,000 years ago, I mean, we're talking about, you know, about not long after or around the time that uh, Doggerland was finally uh, submerged. So mm. it's, a, it's an interesting one. And we can, you know, the thing is, interesting thing that Vince has said about that, about that, is that it is anomalous. There's no question about that because it is one single e example. And he said those words, I remember in the interview, he said, we haven't been able to falsify it yet. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's always music to your ears, isn't it? When yeah. you've got people who are, they're desperately trying to say, because uh, he actually said um, uh, in the interview, he said, you know, and, and then you get some information that you really don't want. <laughs> 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 yeah. um, and you know and they they tried uh they you know they tried every which way to make it wrong you know this can't be right this can't be right but they just they they couldn't it just the data just yeah. kept on coming back absolutely rock solid yeah yeah but the short answer is no we we haven't got enough concrete uh, evidence a, a about this to be able to say whether we should readjust our thinking about uh, farmers and 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 farming uh, at that time, and what Mesolithic people were up to, I think uh, the uh, the actual existence of that jetty, uh, of the ship, you know, the boat building and stuff, was more of a shift in people's understanding yeah. of what the Mesolithic people were up to. And yeah. it, it's that, kind of putting two and two together, isn't it? If you've got a jetty, uh, that uh, mm. sort of extrapolates to a, a Mesolithic harbour, and what happens in harbours? Trade. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, it's uh, again interpretations, but the you know, you know, the, the the one of the basic unavoidable facts that came out of that was that there were carpentry techniques used in this place that uh, that they pushed how how carpentry had been thought to have developed in Britain. Uh, well, it pushed that back by 2,000 years. There was, mm, I, you know, yeah. I don't know the technicalities of it, but the way the wood was actually worked was way more sophisticated than anyone ever thought uh, it mm, would have been mm. in the Mesolithic. So that in itself is is fascinating. You know, okay. So many possible things coming from uh, that. Thanks, Matt. I think we'll uh, leave that one there. I'll tell you what I want to do. Uh, Jim, uh, Jim P Pennin uh, is a name I've not seen uh, on the uh, uh, Hello, Jim. With, with us before, but I thought we'd maybe quickly honour uh, Jim's uh, question there. We do tend to, you know, um, keep it to the questions that have been asked um, previously before the, uh, the programme. Um, but Jim says, I've heard that Neanderthals might have been just as smart as us, but we're better, we're better at being social and living in large groups. What do you think guys think, know about this theory? Uh, to be honest, yeah. I, I wouldn't begin to, I, I sort of agree, but I don't have the background and you know, evidence and haven't done the deep dives on, on those kinds of theories to be able to give you any kind of de definitive thing. That they were as smart as us, uh, yeah, buy into that, absolutely. 
Yes, it... and uh, there's there is a certain amount of evidence to say that, that Neanderthals uh, were more artistic than uh, than us, um, uh, and arguably more creative than us. Um, quite possibly more aggressive, uh, less aggressive than us. We're more aggressive, mm. aggressive than them. Um, there's, I mean, there's various things around that. Uh, the thing about la- living in uh, us being, you know, sort of modern humans um, mm. being better at living in larger groups, uh, th- that's a big maybe, really. Um, that you know, yeah. some of the Neanderthal settlements have been just well, as big as any of the more. Hang humans. about, because there's an interesting segue into a, a, a later question here, um, because of mm. something I think again I may have read. In the Daily Express, no, it wasn't. It was to do with them. Um, <laughs> it was to do with me. <laughs> um, I'll start worrying about you. You was, mentioned the Daily Express more than once. It, it comes up in yeah. my news feed so often, you know, because I've got a feed set up, you know, to do with prehistoric archaeology, and of course, any any time. This cycle of stuff that comes out of the Daily Express when they haven't got anything better to do with something with Stonehenge in the uh, in the title, even though it's ten years old. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'll get off that rant. Um, uh, yeah, it was to do with musical instruments, and we may get on to it uh, next. Uh, yeah. But before we do, actually, I notice you know we've gathered numbers, uh, and obviously there are a lot of people watching us now that have probably never been uh, on a Prehistory Guys Q and A, or probably never been to the channel before. Just very quickly say if you're enjoying what we do, we think you know, uh, and have a look at the rest of the channel first, and have a look around, see if you uh, like what we're up to. Uh, if you do, do have a look at our Patreon page, link in uh, just down below. Uh, we've got a fantastic community there, and extra perks and um, advantages to uh, uh, being a member and uh, and helping support us. There are other ways of helping support us. Do you know what I haven't noticed before? Um, but there's a little button that says thank you somewhere down there o- along the along the line there yeah and you can make a, a one off donation via um via youtube do, do you know that cool it says thanks or th- uh, thank you if you want to say thank you try clicking that <laughs> button you never know fantastic sorry i thought i yeah you have to do this <laughs> fantastic yeah oh, <laughs> susan staples hello susan uh, mm. and welcome mm-hmm. um uh, shall I move uh, on to that question? Because I think yeah, uh, did do we d- deal with that uh, uh, well, properly. It, it, Let me just twiddle, uh, me, think, twiddle uh, me knobs we'll, a moment. Well, we'll probably go back to it though, won't we? Um, you know, yeah. because there there are so many aspects about Neanderthals. I mean, the, the fact that we know that Neanderthals and Denisovans were interbreeding, um, uh, uh, you know, that in itself. You look at the sophistication of some of the Denisovan artifacts and think well you know if they were actually interbreeding uh and living together we know that they were living together in uh, uh in denisova apart from oh god in fact all over the place there's a number of sites now aren't there um but uh, no what i'm saying is that uh, that you know going back then we would have just whether it's modern humans Neanderthals, Denisovans, or any of the other um, hominins that would have been around 40,000 years ago, uh, that they wouldn't have been looking at each other as different species. They'd have just been slightly different looking people. Um, So, you know, to have them kind of living in smaller or larger groups is kind of, there are so many variables. To so be fair, variables. to be fair, anthropology, which is where this goes over into, it's not an avenue that we've studied and, and gone into. So well, these are well, not so much. Yeah. Well, you more than me, uh, probably. Uh, but uh, you know, sometimes it's a little bit more than our poor tiny brains can take. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there, yeah, I'd say a little a knowledge few... is a dangerous thing. Uh, true, but there's a few anthropology books that I think are important for anybody to read, which makes me think, rather than me going off and getting those and talking about those and changing the subject, we really should do a programme that is about what we think is uh, our important uh, book references. Our, our important book. Our, our important book list. Book. Our the book Prehistory list. Guys book list. 
Yes, uh, people are pressing us to to do that. What form that mm. will take, I don't know. Anyway, we've had the next question hanging there because I thought that was a segue from uh, from Jim's uh, question because I remember reading uh, in the uh, the page that you sent me about the eight oldest musical instruments there are. Uh, yes. I'll, get, I'll get to it in a moment. But really good question, Dorman. Any examples of evidence of musical instruments before the Bronze Age? I didn't know this, but Rupert, you were straight in there um, and you found... They're all flutes, as far as I can make out. <laughs> well, but talk about flutes, dates. Uh, well, in fact, the, the one that's at the top of the list that, uh, that on the page that I sent you... Yeah. There's actually contention about that. There is a Neanderthal flute that uh, it's generally thought to be about 40,000 years old. It might be as much as 60,000 years old. Um, and uh, it's quite remarkable. The, the holes in it, the finger holes in it, are absolutely perfectly circular. Um, and I, I find that... Oh, have you got pictures there? Excellent. Well done. Well, um, I might be able, if I can sort myself out. Hold on. <laughs> um, it's interesting because uh, this particular one was found in Slovenia. Um, now there's... God, they found flutes, Neanderthal flutes in France. Um, All right. It's not the one you were thinking of, is it? Uh, no, keep... You, uh, okay. No, no, no. That's the one. Oh, which one? This one. That one. That Slovenia, one. yes. Gigi Barbe flute. Now, I, I don't know how they, they give that as 40, what does that say? 43,000 years old. Uh, so uh, other archaeologists uh, do think that that might be as much as 60,000 years old. But look at those holes, <laughs> those finger holes. Yes, Absolutely. Look at those holes, okay. Perfectly. Well, but the thing is, it's it's a bit like, do you remember when we looked at the uh, the Denisovan bracelet, that beautiful Denisovan bracelet that's again, it's about the same age as this, uh, well, 40,000, not 60,000, um, and the sophistication of this bracelet with perfectly drilled circular holes to secure it oh my goodness you think you know these people were not primitive they really weren't um i find that yeah. uh, that remarkable actually the uh the, the cleanliness so the oldest one is the, at the bottom of the page this isn't the one that they uh, surmised might have had uh been bitten by two, two that of it wolves. is it is that one there oh, is, is another bunch of researchers who think that what who planet? think that you know, they think that no that wasn't made by uh, people that's actually just been bitten by hyenas you think yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, yeah i'm just going <laughs> down a bit uh i think that one we're looking at there is another is it not Neanderthal? 42, 43,000 years old. But this is a bit it, which um, made me think during answering the last question from uh, Jim that some researchers believe that these flutes and other early musical instruments helped large groups of early humans develop and maintain strong bonds. It's part of my brain goes, well, duh. <laughs> so, have you have you been to a music yeah. concert? <laughs> yeah. It's true. I mean, it's true. You got to say something, uh, I guess, but it's sort of yeah. asinine. Uh, and they believe that these bonds helped our species expand its territories further than the more conservative Neanderthals, who went extinct in most parts of Europe about thirty thirty thousand years ago. That's all, mm. the link. That's the link I was thinking of. So okay. that's what I'm going to say. About that, yeah. uh, what, what else though? Um, well, I mean, in you simple need to talk about to, um, uh, in simple answers to the question, most of the musical instruments found are flutes because they're made from bone, which lasts yeah. in the archaeological record. Uh, undoubtedly, they would have had drums. 35. 
Um, but you know, if they uh, now look that one that was found in France, and uh, and you look at those holes in comparison, you know the, uh, that yeah. that's you know significantly younger than that. But the the just the perfection of those of the you know the circular holes in that uh, in yeah, the made previous to fit one. fingers, yeah, yeah, just stunning. Um, but oh, uh, uh, something that I, isn't a it, flute. Well, there's a bull roarer. Yeah, there's the the bull roarer. I'm. Uh, it's interesting that they've put that in as a musical instrument. Yeah. Uh, would you call that? I mean, a noise maker. Would What's you call that, that doing a musical in there? Instrument, maybe. <laughs> yeah, that's a curious way of displaying it. But um, oh, it's somebody that it's it's uh, it's somebody that has got a lot of resonant uh, rocks. Yeah. Uh, ringing stones that ring and have arranged them in the form of a harpsichord. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Okay, it's, that's what uh, bamboos on this thing. But, yeah. um, uh, but it's certainly true that there are uh, examples of ringing stones in a number of places and mm. uh, and it's amazing how pure the sound is as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and then uh, yes, I've, I've been the... privileged enough to dong an Inca one in northern Argentina. Uh, have you? Bong, yes. bong. Yeah. Just looks like yes. a lump of ordinary rock, but you hit it and, uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Um, yeah, and that is it. It's a wonderful thing. The absence of drums. But that's because they'd have been made of wood. They'd have been made well, of wood. I, and I know. And why they, but I can't imagine. Can you imagine a world without drumming? No. No. That would there be wrong. That's, that's, that was the point I was trying to make. <laughs> Nevertheless, we do not have the drums. Uh, Tutankhamun's trumpets, 3,340 years old. Xylostone, absolutely. I have to tell a story about Tutankhamun's uh, trumpets because um, they look very much like uh, sort of ancient Roman trumpets as well. My father yeah. was an actor. I was an actor for uh, a large part of my professional, you know, my grown-up life. And uh, my father was at the Royal Shakespeare Company and they did the Roman season in which the, they had they equipped the entire orchestra of the Royal Shakespeare Company with ancient instruments, replicas of ancient instruments. And they sounded awesome. <laughs> um, and my dad was in this uh, version of uh, Julius Caesar. Um, my dad uh, died uh, quite some years ago and they had held a memorial service for him in the... Uh, church in Stratford upon Haven, and my God, I could have wept. They dug out these replica instruments from uh, that looked very much like these, and the musicians got them out and played them at his memorial service. I tell you, that was fantastic. Amazing. Sorry to die, die, you know. Hey. Uh, yeah, it's a story, but there we go. Yeah. Uh, okay, uh, you didn't want to see that. Back to normality. <laughs> there we go. You can call that Wonderful normal. Stuff. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, obviously, the, the simple answer to that question is, yes, so many examples of musical instruments before the Bronze Age. Do you know yeah. what? If you, um, if you just... Uh, what do you want me to Google do? Google them. Uh, oh. No, no, no. I'm just uh, I'm saying to um, anybody yeah. interested, really, you know, you mm. just Google uh, earliest known uh, musical instruments. I mean, there's so many, so many. David, Citizen David, uh, says, Hello, David. it seems as every week news of more stones. You've been reading the Daily Express. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. It seems as every week news of more stones, circles and mounds are discovered across the UK. Soon every square inch of the island will be under the Historical Preservation Society management why so much archaeology and, in some cases, continued usage up to the Romans? Mm -hmm. could, those, could those residents living within Doggerland maybe use the Highlands, the UK, for pure mystical celebrations and raising of spiritual spots? UK would have been mostly covered in woodland, right? It all started with Doggers. Uh, maybe they just found first found the remnants of an of old, older sites and used them. Makes a good story. Once upon a time, and during a cold and rainy night, who knows? Well, there's a there's a bit to unpack there, uh, uh, David. 
Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I have to question the the assumptions here a lot of the time. And I don't know if are, are you in the UK yourself, David, or um, elsewhere in the world? If you're there, um, let us know. But it isn't quite doesn't ring true that every week news are more stones and circles and mounds because they belong in the Neolithic and we they're rarely discovered uh, yeah, anymore. Uh, People come yeah. up with new ideas yeah. and uh, about them uh, and new evidence that sometimes that may point at their usage, but it's very very rare to find a, a, a new thing in from the Neolithic. Uh, yeah, so David's in the states. He's just said David, okay, so, uh, fine. Um, well, okay, great. That, that, that's that's great because it gives us an opportunity to do something here and mm. you know and, and lay these uh, uh, things what, out. What does happen occasionally, and a good example is uh, is just comparatively recently uh, a new site up in Orkney, so just literally down the coast from Scarborough Bray, yeah. uh, a new site was uncovered uh, once again from uh, uh, the sea, just. Um, uh, washing away uh, mm. soil and revealing something else. So it's a race against time to actually see what they can find out before it gets mm. uh, further destroyed. There have been a few sites that have been covered by coastal erosion, but across the country, no, as Michael said, no. I mean, it's, it's, it's rare, very rare that a new, completely new site is found. They found mm. a new Roman, uh, or in yeah. fact, a couple of, uh, of new Roman uh, uh, yeah. Buildings and settlements have been found, but not so. That said, of course, it, it was only a few years ago, and this is really rare. Uh, a new mm. long barrow was discovered near Sirencester, mm. uh, which is uh, uh, under investigation uh, now um, mm. by uh, Tim Darville. Um, but that's really, really rare to find a new. Yeah. Long barrow uh, or anything like that. Um, yes. Most of them have been uh, found. <laughs> put it that way. The you know because a lot of it is on farming land, and of course we have the wonderful um, um, ordnance survey maps uh, for uh, the UK. Uh, and if something isn't on <laughs> on the ordnance survey map, um, it, obviously it's not. It's not uh, above ground, um, but even the ones that are being discovered via lidar and things like that uh, are, are pretty few and far between. And why so much archaeology? That's an easy one um, because there's a lot of develop development going on. The uh, major project in the UK at the moment is the HS2 railway line, uh, which is going to stretch from London right up to... Um, where? Where's its terminal going to be, Rupert? The HS2? Oh, I can't Is it remember. Edinburgh? I just hope they so don't do just it. don't know. Forgive ignorance on that point. But it's, it's major. And there's so much archaeology going on from that uh, development that in the UK we're actually short of archaeologists. <laughs> Uh, uh, you know, and that is that is one reason, and, and that's going to, you know, p give you all kinds of. Uh, uh... Ignore me. I'm just laughing at some of the comments coming up. It's fine. Okay, as long as you're not laughing at me, that's all right. I get paranoid. Well, no more than usual. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but you take the point, uh, uh, David. Um, yeah, obviously, there's a lot of academic uh, archaeology goes on, but it pales into insignificance behind behind, uh, behind the uh, archaeology that uh, gets done simply because it has to be done because JCBs are digging up the soil that uh, hasn't been yeah. dug up before. It needs to be examined before then. Now, yeah. Doggerland. Now, the thing with Doggerland, there's a, there's a, there's a problem of chronology uh, with your hypothesis or your suggestion. Mm here um, because uh, which way around should we do this um, well if you want to put it succinctly that yeah. all the stone circles yeah. from the Neolithic onwards uh, you're talking about them being built thousands of years after the tsunami that 
completely erased Doggerland from uh, yeah. f- uh, from the surface landscape. Yeah. Um, the, the, certainly the there first, would have been people... The very first uh, megalithic building uh, on um, British soil, as it were, sorry, I use the word British, it wouldn't have been obvious, you know what I mean, uh, yes, happened at least 2,000... Yeah, it happened, happened at least 2,000 years after Doggerland had been submerged. So mm. there weren't any pre-existing uh, monuments or anything like that. And Britain itself would have been a bit of an outlier. You'd have to have pretty good reason to um, go go there. I'll tell you what. Um, bah, bah, bah. Have you got that map? I, I've got that map. Here we go. There you go. That's beautiful. I love this. That illustrates... Mm. Uh, uh, what's going on here? So that so dark green the, area, the green area between uh, the coastline what's, that's outlined of the Netherlands, Belgium and, and, and France there, um, that would have been dry land. You see, there are yeah. rivers and lakes within it there. Um, but that now, is caught, of course, is the English Channel and the North Sea. Uh, mm. Now completely, you know, and deeply underwater as well. Mm. So... And, of course, the context of this is that this is the extreme sort of north um, uh, west end of northern uh, northwest Europe. So Britain, as it was then, is a bit of an outlier. You'd have to be pushing it to want to go there. <laughs> now, obviously, people were settled, it seems, you know, on uh, Dogger Bank. Um, but... It seems that the lands were pretty fertile. There was plenty of mammoth and other, uh, mm. uh, you know, uh, land-based uh, animals and uh, upon which to uh, subsist. Uh, I don't know if there's any evidence about whether or not uh, uh, Britain was forested or not. We'd have to ask a friend of ours called Mike... Um, well, yeah, Mike Allen has shown quite Mike conclusively Allen. that oh, um, uh, <laughs> Mike Allen has shown quite conclusively that Britain was not entirely covered in forest, uh, as was once thought, um, and a lot of the chalk downlands were always unforested. Mm. But it's also fair to say that it, you can say that most of it was forested. Mm. Um, certainly, going across. Uh, Doggerland, and and from uh, some of the dredging that has been done, you know, they have yeah. pulled up um, uh, some artifacts that, uh, you know. So we we know. I mean, obviously, it, it would be silly to presume otherwise, but obviously there were people uh, on it, uh, mm. but few and far between. The populations in northern, uh, yeah. you know, uh, on the North European continent, uh, you know, there were tiny numbers of people. Um, it, well, here's the I thing. They, they hardly left anything behind. So it mm. is really not known how populated um, mm. Britain was. And here's the irony that we'll probably get a better idea of how well populated Doggerland was than Britain in the upcoming years. As the mm. techniques you know, that have been developed and, yeah. and pioneered by uh, Vince come to fruition, and we get the sedimentary DNA from around the uh, rivers and lakes that are down there where people would have been gathering, would have been settled. There's far more riches to be found there as evidence of what people were doing and where they were living than there is in, on the mainland now where everywhere, everywhere's been ploughed over. And, and farmed or you know or there is no clue about where you should look for such things i only yeah. just had that thought interesting one <laughs> <laughs> yes um I, i'm just going to put uh, a link oh you've done um, you're doing that aren't you? uh, uh, yeah well because yeah. that map uh, you can actually find it in a few places, but the easiest I, one I is the National Geographic uh, site. Yeah, I, I think it's on Wikipedia as well. I think that map is. I oh, it probably is, but um, the National Geographic site is yeah. Yeah. as good as any. Uh, so, if you do a Google search on it, though, you can actually find some larger... Yeah. Um, oh, in fact, do you know what? I'm saying that. The, uh, oh, it tells you on the site. The map was actually by 
William McNulty and Jerome Cookson. Uh, if you Google that, you'll find some bigger versions of it. They are available. Okay. Uh, David, Citizen David, you're very welcome, sir. And, uh, yeah, I hope... Um, yes. Yeah, yeah. I hope you... Um, yeah, I hope um, that it's it's always a benefit to us all, though. You know, when questions like that get asked, and gives us a, a, a chance to just nail these things, because these chronologies are, are important, and uh, and there's much more. There's much more to be told, David. Much more to be told. But thank you for that. Mm. Um, I think uh, we're coming towards. That's not right. That's just me. You don't want to see that. <laughs> <laughs> Um, the last question because we've answered Dorman Benjamin is there evidence of sacrifice in prehistory also is there evidence of dynasties in prehistory in tombs, art or artefacts mm. wow well, well that's, a, that's a huge uh, hu <laughs> That's well, it's one of those questions. The first part of Benjamin's question is one of those that speaks to what I was talking about earlier. Well, who's to say? And mm. how would you find out? How would you determine what evidence of sacrifice is? Mm. That's the that's the question. How am I going to find that out? Um, so, what would evidence of sacrifice actually look like? That's a really mm. hard question. Uh, it's also interesting to. Um, uh, to say so for example when we say prehistory by definition prehistory is anywhere that people weren't writing things down so you could argue that uh, that Inca is prehistoric uh, before the Spanish sure, got there. Do, that is true. Um, and, <laughs> and we do know <laughs> quite a bit about uh, Inca uh, sacrificial practices yes. but I suspect that that's not what we're talking about here uh, hold everything it, it, for a moment need to say thank you to Andy You're most generous sir uh, thank you so oh, Andy. much for that. yeah yeah um, thank you uh, yeah yeah uh, Andy says I think I have connecting trade routes from the southwest peninsula to the silver pit on Doggerland wow Ooh. you'd have to expand a bit on that um, yeah. Andy yeah uh, send us um not quite, yeah, not, that's uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. Um, s send us more on that because um, that's not sort of going ding in my head with something I already know. So, <laughs> if you've got stuff I don't know, or him over there, Sibylla says my problem is always to frame a question in just three lines. <laughs> 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 yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, um, cool. <laughs> but uh, no, a, a sacrifice in prehistory. Um, it's all down to interpretation, isn't it? You know, I mean, there are some people, for example, who interpret some of the bog people as sacrifices. Yeah. Um, whereas, I'll be honest, I've looked at lots of them and thought, uh, it could just as easily have been execution. You know, if yeah. it's uh, uh, you know, a criminal of some sort, well, you know, stick a rope around his neck and deal with him in the bog. Because one of the things, you know, that you could argue... And again, this is it's all interpretation. You know, you could say that if you actually put somebody into a place where you know that they're going to be preserved, then could that be a way of saying, well, we're not going to let you go to the afterlife. You'll Ooh. be stuck here forever. Stuck um, in, the, in the liminal place. The indeed. Uh, you know, so, uh, wow, uh, yes. so it's, um, it's an interesting one, sacrifice, because it is all down to interpretation. Um, uh, evidence of dynasties in real well, obviously, you know, if ah. you're stepping outside of the the obvious ones of you know Egyptian dynasties, for example, yeah, um, and uh, and Chinese uh, dynasties. Well, one of the things that has come up as a possibility, and we've got to be careful about you know putting a badge on it because we don't know. But some of the stuff that came out of Newgrange last year, the yeah. the DNA analysis that showed that the uh, the burials were related to a brother and sister coupling. So brother and sister were married, uh, or certainly were parents of children, which is you know exactly what was going on in uh, yeah, in Egypt amongst other places, which gave rise to a lot of people theorising that therefore. Uh, it was showing dynastic 
mm. stuff in Ireland. Mm. And you can't deny that it's a possibility, but we mm. don't yet have enough information mm. uh, to say that that's the case. You, you know, yeah. I mean, there are there's all sorts of situations it is that could it give is rise fairly to. safe to say though the only time that that um, incest uh, is not taboo is at the tops of dynastic families totally yeah 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 and you know maybe it maybe a reach too far to extrapolate from that that uh, that's what was going on back there but you, but you can't throw it out i think the other parts of that study did show that there were at least strong familial connections between uh, Bruna Boigne and uh, tombs over to uh, the west, over to Sligo, and up to the north east as well, and down in the south, come to think of it. No, not so much down in the south. That was a bit separate. But there were, mm. you know, familial connections, uh, DNA connections going on. So we are talking about mm. uh, at least an upper echelon, if not, you know, actual dynasties um, in mm. the, those terms. Um, what was the name mm. of the lead archaeologist out of Dublin University? Um, Lee, um, <laughs> oh, sorry, Cassidy, Lara Cassidy. Oh, Lara! Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, yeah, that was yeah. her study. Yeah, yeah, well done. Yeah, yeah. Um, um, but also, I was just going to pick up. Yeah, no, go on. Yeah, go on. No, I was just going to pick up on a couple of comments because uh, yeah, yeah, sure. The, the, the full Irish GK Gary. <laughs> yeah, that's a great handle. Uh, Gary says some of the bog bodies in air were sacrificed, tied, and nipples removed. Uh, and in the Bro, so Brony Boyne, uh, Boyne, the Boyne. DNA proves an elite dynasty. Um, well, well, the thing is, it doesn't, though, that, yeah. uh, and that's uh, that's what I mean. It might, but it doesn't prove it. It, it certainly um, it certainly implies it. Um, um, but um, but also the bog bodies uh, that were sacrificed, tied, and nipples removed. Well, uh, you know, a, again, um, could be just straightforward punishment. It, it is it is quite possible that they are sacrifices but you can't say mm. that for certain because mm. it could have been execution it could have that that you know the nipples removed could have been well that's going to hurt you know that, that could that could have been quite deliberate um uh, infliction you know, uh, of torturing infl uh, indeed infliction mm. of pain when you're going to mm -hmm. dispatch uh, somebody if you, um, so and that I'm, is a good I'm, point rupert because if you sacrifice if you're making a sacrifice it's not part of the deal to inflict pain usually no, you uh, don't sacrifice is made with honor mm. and with a quick dispatch mm. um he said thinking yeah. about ripping out of hearts and lungs and and things you know <laughs> yeah, actually no okay so that's a good point but the, the thing about the aztec uh, uh sacrifices as opposed to because okay Inca sacrifices were always very uh, respectful. They tended to, uh, uh, you know, stack them up with coca leaves, mm -hmm. um, uh, and uh, you know they were, you know, they were doped up and uh, and carefully interred. Uh, and in fact, if you've seen any of the uh, the mummies that uh, the Peruvian mummies that have been found some of them i mean there's one in particular that haunts me i, I saw it when it was first found oh, i can't remember how many years ago i was a kid um and it, it's a girl a little girl that was sacrificed and to this day uh she just looks like she's sleeping um mm. Amazing. But anyway, sorry, I digress. Um, Cyclical so, Cycler says, uh, well, the Tolland man displayed at uh, Mossegard Museum, Arthus, 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 seems to be sacrificed. Well, that's rather the point. It seems is not is or was. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. And by what yeah. parameters does he seem to be sacrificed? That's the whole yeah. uh, point. Because it's what we were saying. So we're not saying you're wrong. No. We're just saying that we don't think that any of us can be as certain as sometimes we think we are. Yeah. Um, because, it, again, it's all down to the interpretation. So certainly they might have been, yeah. but I, I don't think it's by any means a certainty. The yeah. I, I think when you've got cultures like the Aztecs who were so fearful of the gods that they did the ripping out of the heart bit and all the rest of it, 
okay, that's a mutilation. But um, but you know they they didn't they didn't bury those uh, those bodies you know they didn't do anything ceremonial with those bodies they ripped them <laughs> they ripped them to bits and just tossed them to the side so you know the uh, the vultures would have uh, uh, dealt with oh, the rest of them and um, when we're talking about um, aztec sacrifice aren't we talking about vowed enemies prisoners actually so we're not talking about pris mm. uh, um, uh, uh, sacrifice of uh, their own um, side as it were uh, yeah, yeah. That's, a, that's a movable feast but generally that's uh, that's true um, uh, good night nigel and thank you for being with us i understand the need nigel. to go to bed. You've, you've, been, you've, you've been listening <laughs> yeah. to us with yeah. for two hours yeah. i would need to go to bed i should go to, we should go it's to bed. 11 here yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh bless you thank yeah. you for sticking with us folks um uh, <laughs> But there's been such yes. great questions tonight, you know, and, and stuff. They but to, just the last yeah. point to round off uh, with, which is the last, this is the last question, by the way, uh, Benjamin's question, is we mustn't forget the stuff that's come out of Hazelton North Longbarrow just recently. And we must get our hands on that paper talking about dynasties. Oh, now, I thought you not... were saying sacrifices. Yeah, that's, oh, no, no. Um... <laughs> yeah, although that's, but that's a, that's a family lineage, though. You, I I don't know that you could call yeah, it a yeah. dynasty. No, um, uh, but you could extrapolate from it the possibility of, and yes, especially you when you're thinking about these yeah. are uh, these are the early early farmer folk in uh, in Britain. Uh, you know, in a Cotswold um, Seven uh, Long Barrow. You know, not that long after the first timber houses and stuff were being built. This is really early stuff, and the familial relationships that have come from the evidence from the DNA inside. That's just this one long barrier. It's phenomenal in terms of building yeah. a picture of, uh, you know, how people related to each other, how they thought about each other, who was, who was, who was sleeping with who. <laughs> it's a whole detective story in that. I really mm. strongly advise you uh, take a take a look if you can find the study. Yeah. Hello, Hugh. Yeah, hello, Megalithomania Hugh. UK. Great to see you too. And yes, we were saying... <laughs> Hope you're well. <laughs> Welcome to the Men in Beige Jumper Show. <laughs> Jum <laughs> beige. <laughs> yeah. We didn't yeah, synchronize. It, it, it was not deliberate, I assure yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and it's also not the first time that it's happened. <laughs> Yeah, uh, and the uh, Lee Clare interview on Gobekli Tepe is uh, coming soon. Mm. To answer that question, um, I would say yeah. it's a week away, something like that. Okay, with the following week. Exciting, yeah, yeah, it's definitely worth the wait. Worth the wait. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, well, uh, uh, Hugh has the advantage on us there. He has actually been to Gobekli Tepe. Yes, he and has. to Kalan Tepe as well. S uh, and maybe other yeah. places besides. Uh, we're for, hoping for any to... of you that don't know, uh, ha have a look at uh, Megalithomania. Oh sure, uh, UK. Uh, yeah, yeah, Hugh does uh, does wonderful work, and good grief does he get about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't know where you find the time, mate. I really don't. Uh, uh, listen, I want to pick up on uh, on a comment that uh, that Gary made. I've lost your comment, Gary. Um, uh, Going back, back uh, Gary back thinks it, that it proves the reason it. for the Brunei Boyne, uh, but uh, he says um, he failed his clan and the land um, has to be reborn with a new chief. Now, uh, this is where you totally have the advantage because Mike and I are, uh, 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 to be honest, ignorant about Irish, Irish mythology. And we always rely on our good friend Anthony Murphy when yeah. we need to pick up on any Irish mythology. Um, and one of the problems that we have extracting stuff from mythology is that you you have the stories, but in, the trouble with mythology is it's Chinese whispers, you know, that you don't know uh, the integrity of that through the millennia. So, you know, it might tell you the truth about a situation or like Christianity, it might be an adopted 
story from somewhere else and they, you know and it gets changed along the way you know going back to the first question of the evening with uh, mm -hmm. you know uh, orion and uh, and the three wise men following the star and you know uh, it, it's interesting really how the stories mm -hmm. hang on through history but their accuracy is something that should never be presumed i think mm -hmm. interesting though uh, and thanks uh for that Graham Allen uh, asks, does the Hazleton North evidence suggest a local boss and their offspring? Yes, it does. Um, in a nutshell, we've got a local boss who coupled with uh, four women, and it is basically the descendants of that those couplings that are in that um, that were mm. in that barrow. Uh, interestingly, only one uh, of those strands, um, goes right through to the fourth generation in in the burial. The, it, it's interesting. We think of, I'm going off on one a bit here, but we think of long barrows as being sort of long, <laughs> as being uh, deep in time. And so we put all, upon them occupation or usage over long periods of time. But in the grand terms, the uh, four generations is not that long. Um, you know, a few hundred, a couple of hundred years, which is max. Oh, what tops? Tops. Yeah. That's a blink. Uh, yeah. So uh, realistically, uh, we're talking about the, uh, yeah. you know, not so much the, in the century. Back then. So the fact that we can still see them in the landscape, or well, some of them, gee, so many of them, you know, most of them have gone, gone, gone. But the fact that you know some of them are still extant gives us this illusion that they were you know, used over a long period of time. No, they weren't. They were culturally, they were things that were seemed a good idea at the time, and then they went out of fashion, went out of use, and and people moved on. Mm. That's about it. I can say no more about that. Uh, Andy, good night. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yes, good night, Andy. You gone? Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mythology is fun. Uh, succession. <laughs> yes, I, I'm, yes, we're addicted to the series. We think it's the, one of the best things and best written and performed things on television. If that's what you're referring to, Graham, uh, um, which died out with the young. That's absolutely. You're, you're absolutely on the money. Yes, uh, the, uh, the the last burial is just a single. Uh, a, a single burial in, in the fourth mm. generation there. It's fascinating. Mm. Uh, now saying West Kennet only used for 35 years. Yes, Kate. Yeah. Mm. Dif such a different perspective when you think about these short time scales. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, thank yeah. you for that, Kath. Uh, greatly appreciated. I've enjoyed tonight uh, very much indeed, and I hope uh, the folk that have uh, hung on in with us there and kept with us to the end uh, have enjoyed it just as much as well uh, as I say uh, we um, um, we're always grateful of the support you know both um, uh, the moral support and the financial support <laughs> yes indeed um, uh, so thank you those of you who are our patron supporters uh, blessings to you and if you're thinking about becoming a patron supporter blessings to you too for even considering mm. it um, thank you for people that have considered donating um, below and thank you to those that have um, so this is it signing off yeah. until the next yes. time thank you very much yes I'm going to pick up I'm just going to say thank you California Harvest how about the caves and tablets uh, found near uh, Manti in Utah. Don't know anything about them. I will go and look them up. Thank you very we much. Should do, uh, <laughs> we should do. I'll do. I'm going to do a poll actually to find out how much people would like us to, to do a bit of a dive. You know, just to get into uh, American prehistory just a, a a bit more. We need to hmm. do some learning in there. But uh, yeah, if, we do. If, if you'd like us to, then uh, we will do that thing. Uh, okay, I've said enough. Have you said enough, Rupert? Yeah, I've said was that, was that Thank yes. you very much, folks, <laughs> and thanks for the questions. Yeah, and uh, we'll, we'll see you next time. See you in February. Yeah. Cheers, folks. Bye bye. Take good care. Keep warm.